morning, everybody. Welcome to Photo Joseph's Photo Moment, the first live daily photo show on YouTube every weekday morning, 9.30 Pacific. You should be watching live if you're not, because it's a lot of fun when you watch live. You get to participate in the comments. You get to ask questions, like my friends here, Jess and Osho and Scott Colesby and Extender and whoever else is still filing in this morning. So, hey, as always, if you want to ask a question, please go right ahead. Do precede the question with at Photo Joseph. That will uh, let me know that, uh, that it's for me. Otherwise, it's like stuff going by. It's kind of crazy. And as always, if you want to really, really get my attention, you're watching live, there's that little super chat button. Of course, if you're not watching live, John Warby, good morning. Omar, good morning. If you're not watching live, you can always put a comment in and I'll do my best to get to it. Um, not doing such a good job lately at responding to comments in the, in the comments thing. And I'll tell you why. It's not for lack of effort. A lot of questions, really good questions are coming in that are more complex and they include links. And, you know, links. Google's heard of them, I'm sure. But for some reason, the YouTube app doesn't, in the comments, doesn't hyperlink the links. So unless you're sending me to apple.com, if I've got a long URL, I gotta go out and type it or go on the computer. So I go, okay, I'll do this on the computer. But then I never do this when I'm on the computer. So it's not your problem, not your fault. It's just this annoying YouTube thing. If anybody knows a better way to manage comments other than a web browser, which their comment system kind of sucks there, or the app, which sucks, big suck for doing comments, if anybody knows of a better way to manage YouTube comments, I'm all ears. I would like to be better at them, but I just, eh, the tools are not helpful. Good morning, Solomon. And uh, yeah, John's confirming he's not a fan of the mobile app. So there you go. So today's topic, today's thing is uh, we're going to do a little behind the photo. And uh, let's see, where did it go? I already fired it up here. There it is. Um, behind the photo. And this is at, this was a, let me bring up the key photo that I did. Let's go full screen on this. Here we go. This was, uh, quite a few years ago I shot these. This was at a... Uh, a live event, a, I set up a photo, oops, uh, there we go, right one, set up a photo booth, uh, you know, tired just to do this photo booth at this event, and this thing called the Caddy Wampus. It was honestly, it was just like one of the best parties Ashland has ever seen. It was so cool. Uh, we have this old, this place called the Old Armory, and it's used for live events now, and it's, you know, just a big room, and they did all kinds of crazy decorations, had great music, they had performers and, and dancers, and they things hanging from the, it was awesome anyway so they wanted me to do this photo booth okay what am i going to do something cool funky i know people are going to be all dressed up like her <laughs> um and have some fun with it and I, I probably was looking through pinterest as you do and uh, came up with this this aluminum foil background and all it is is i went through quite a few of these um i think i bought the cheap stuff because you know, but i bought a bunch of they bought the super wide and you can see in the photo let's actually go to one that's a bit um maybe not quite uh, here a little bit farther back so it's not quite as oops not quite as bokeh um you can see there it is a bunch of crumpled up aluminum foil and it just did this really cool job of catching the light making this funky obviously textured metallic background and all i did was i set up a uh what do you call it? a backdrop rack right so two poles and a crossbar which you know i had an actual backdrop one but obviously you could do with the ladders and a broomstick i mean you don't know, come up with any way to do it and then took the foil and it took a while to get the right amount of crinkle but basically did something like this which learned very quickly when you measure it out top to bottom you need at least twice as much because when you crunkle it you know if you go down to the pot and then cut it and then start crunkling it you only get halfway up you're like oops let's do that again so at least twice the length maybe more get it all crumpled up like this and like I said, I used the really wide stuff. Um, you could buy quite wide. You got it all from the dollar store, so it was pretty cheap. It tended to get holes in it. And then, of course, there was the time the drunk shit fell through it. That was wonderful. Put a huge hole in it. Uh, but then just hang it up. Oh, I guess that probably would help helpful if I got that out of the way. Um, and then just hang it up like this. And even here, in this background, where it's not shallow depth of field, so we're not getting a bokeh background, it still looks cool. I mean, that's kind of a cool thing. And it worked really well. And you could even, and I didn't, did I do this there? I didn't do it there because I don't have any pictures from it. I think I did this again in another event, and I started gelling the lights. You know, this one, you can see these pictures are all uh, just the, the background's white. So there are I think, two big pro photo strobes with big umbrellas or softboxes or something. I don't remember. But big light. I wanted big light. Needed a, a fair amount of depth of field because... You know, stuff like this, you got two people, you never know where they're going to move. You can't really control them that well. Uh, we had some big groups, and here I was able to get a little bit shallower depth of field, but that, um, you know, usually it's it's not too shallow. So I need a big, soft, all-around light to uh, to illuminate them, no matter where they were, how they were standing or sitting or whatever, or bouncing or doing their thing. <laughs> There's some great faces here. Look at this guy. That's so awesome. Uh, 
and and uh, yeah, just crumple it up and get it in place and light it. So I did, what I was starting to say was I did another event like this. I put some colored gels on the light on a character. Put some colored gels on the lights or maybe other lights so that the background had blues and reds and stuff like that. And if you put, you know, you've got this crumply background, right? And you shine a blue light this way and a red light this way, you're gonna get different colored reflections on different sides of the crinkles. Really, really neat. See, Jess is saying a restaurant supply store would be a great place to grab lots of foil. Superb, great idea. And then you could probably get industrial strength, really heavy duty stuff. You pay more, but uh, you know, presumably you're getting paid for the job, so it's worth it to build a backdrop that's gonna last throughout the night and not start to disintegrate on you at the first sign of alcohol. Um, but it worked out really well. I just thought it was such a fun thing to do. And so I brought this up today as a, uh, well, multiple reasons. It's you know a little behind the photo, just talk about that. Um, and that's really all there is to it. You know, it's, it's a bunch of this hanging from the backdrop and off you go. But also to bring up the idea of creative and funky backdrops for things like a photo booth or anywhere where you just, you're gonna be doing a bunch of pictures over and over again. You wanna have that cool, unique, different type of background. You know, we all can set up a white seamless and light that or not light it, or um, you build a set or you buy you know, colored seamlesses or you buy textured things. I actually did a whole thing in, was it the DIY? I think it was part of the DIY photographer series. Um, you know, I'm gonna check that real quick. I'm pretty sure that's where it was. And we went to the fabric store and bought a bunch of different fabric bolts. You can get bolts that are quite wide and for different, making different fabric backdrops and some are you know, really colorful, really creative, really interesting. And uh, usually they're not super wide. So you're either gonna have to stitch a couple together, find a pattern that you can match up or use them just for headshots, not for big super wide group shots. But it's a really, it can be a really fun thing to do. Let me see here, if I go to, well, the, the thing that I'm talking about, let me pull this up while I'm looking for it. Uh, the DIY photographer thing that I did, it's here. So this, that's the course that I think is where I did this, but we're gonna find out really quick. I'm gonna use my own shortcut of photojustwithcom slash DIY. And I believe that this is the one, let's see here, let's go and pull this up now, where we did this. Oh, do I need to, I need to log in. Hold on, let me, let me put this back up here so I can sign into my account here, and then we'll take a look at, uh, at the classes that are there, which, here we go, we're up, let's bring this up. So, let's see, so I'm looking at the side list here, change the stabilizer, flash diffuser, creating a little, lighting setup, diffusion with parchment paper, right fabric, maybe this is it. Let's see if this was it. When it comes to yes. DIY photography, the fabric store can be an absolute treasure trove. Chances are you're gonna to need to build a backdrop at some point, whether it's for a portrait or just some object you wanna take a picture of, and a cool backdrop can really make a difference. Now, a fabric store can be a great place to find. So I'm not gonna make you watch the whole thing now, but that's, that's it's so funny, I almost wore that shirt today. How ridiculous would that have been if I wore that shirt today? Um, so that's, it's a super fun way to do creative, unique, different backdrops, right? Why go why go, um, yeah, it's meta, there you go, there's the meta. <laughs> Why go with the train old, plain old traditional seamless, which frankly can be quite expensive um, when you can get all kinds of really creative things. Go to the fabric store, you've got just a litany of things to choose from, or you've got aluminum foil. There's lots and lots of creative things you can do for backdrops, whether you're doing a simple headshot, big group portraits, whatever it might be. I've done, I don't do, I used to do more headshots, and I had a rack outside here of DIY fabric backdrops that I had built, they're all just kind of hanging on the um, on the wall. Just stretch out and I could just pop it down and you know pop, replace the backdrop whenever I wanted. And by using, if you're just doing headshots, you can use smaller ones. You don't need to have a big, huge thing. It's, it's a bit of, more of a challenge when you've got a group shot. But if you're doing headshots or maybe couples and they're gonna be nice and tight in, then uh, you can do, just do all kinds of things. So I wanna know what you guys are doing for backdrops. What do you, for those of you who do things like portraits or photo booths or anything like that, what kind of creative, unique, unusual backdrops are you guys using? Tell me in the chat or tell me in the comments. I just, I'd love to hear it. It's always fun to see what other people are doing. Um, let's see, a couple comments coming in. Uh, Marvin says, what's the minimum space behind for a green screen? That's a really good question. I don't know that there's a an actual measurement because I think it's gonna depend on the lens and how bright your background is and maybe even down to what you're wearing. But in general, the, the thing you're watching for is to not get any reflections back onto you, right? So if you're, if I'm the one who's on camera and I want a green screen behind me, I've talked before about how this wall, I originally painted this wall green as a green screen. 
it didn't work because it was too close. The, the green was reflecting on my shoulders, around my head, on the table, and so those became holes, which obviously didn't work. So I would say, I would guess a minimum of about eight, 10 feet is probably, probably a safe distance. You might be able to go away with a little bit less than that, but I'm, I'm imagining that's probably what you're gonna want uh, as a minimum. And then of course you have to think about size. This is why a lot of green screen, you see a lot of green screen stuff and it's a huge green screen because you need the distance, which means not only do you have to have the distance between your, your subject and the backdrop, but the backdrop then has to get bigger, right? Or else you're gonna see the edges of it. And if you're trying to fill, you know, have someone standing there and have green screen completely around them and have them 10 feet back, that's a big backdrop. You really gotta get big about it. So green screen stuff can get a little complicated that way. If it's just a headshot, talking head, then I can use a long lens, put the camera farther away, go in tight, take advantage of the lens compression effect, right, with a long lens and get away with a much smaller backdrop. The green screen that I used in here was actually blue. It's a green and blue flip one. is a pop-up green screen when I did the WWDC um, kind of MST3K thing and comp myself out. And again, it wasn't perfect. You remember that? It definitely had some fuzzies around the edges, but it was, it was kind of okay. Um, that one is eight feet. It's about eight by four feet. I think that's right. Eight by four feet. And in this environment, it was barely big enough. I and mean, we had to really position it. It's like one inch to the right or to the left too far and you'd see the edge of the background. So it was barely big enough for this space. Um, but anyway, so there you go. So that's that. Hopefully that answers that question. Hey, let me, uh, let me, let me do, let's see here. Now, let's just go into the questions here. You know, we're not going to do a separate Q&A today. So this is what I wanted to talk about. That's kind of over. So let's just go ahead and do the cues now and we won't, we won't do a separate, um, a separate video afterwards. So let's see what else is going on. Marvin says, got a window blind from Ikea. There you go. Just need a carpenter, put it on the ceiling. Oh, perfect. There you go. Window blinds. Great idea. In fact, this is one of those photo moments that I've been, it's on my list, but I need to get my studio back before I can do this. But, uh, I built, actually I had my assistant build, <laughs> um, build a, a, a cookie. It's a huge piece of cardboard with slats cut into it, holes cut into it, stripes to simulate uh, a Venetian blind. So you can shine light through it and get the shadow play of uh, like a Venetian blind. We'll talk about that in another show. I'll show it. I just got to get my studio back right now. It's still set up for the GH5 training, but we'll do that one of these days. But yeah, a re an actual Venetian blind is a great way to, to go about doing that. Joshua, I mostly just use a white backdrop for product photography, fair enough, but I was driving around town and found someone throwing out a transparent tabletop. It's great to remove the shadows from under. So you're, oh, so you're, so you can light it from underneath, you mean? Yeah, if that's what you mean, absolutely. Yeah, you can buy, or you can DIY it, but you can buy product photography uh, surfaces. There's some really nice ones where it's a, it's a white plastic, semi-translucent, plastic so you can illuminate it from underneath and then you'll they have them so that it kind of sweeps it goes and then bends up so you get a nice cove for doing small product photography lighting it from underneath is great like you said it's good to get rid of the shadows it can be a super useful thing i have a huge huge like i don't know six or six by four foot sheet of of acrylic like that that's this white okay it's a little bit too thick it's really hard to light from underneath but i can i can add some light from underneath on it i probably you know, should get something a little thinner if i was going to do more of it but it works it's pretty cool you can do it. uh let's see here what uh was there something else earlier there wasn't okay um kevin wright says there are folks using a retro reflective screen and a green led ring light they look effective in youtube that's probably cherry picked footage um led oh good and led chroma key and chroma mat i have seen these before let me pull this up so hey, by the way, just to, again to shout that out, if you're if you're interested in that that DIY thing, you want to watch the rest of that video, or you want to watch any other DIY videos, do head over to, to mylinda.com, a DIY photographer series. Just type in photojoseph.com/diy, and you will find it. So with that said, let's go ahead and search for LED chroma key. And yeah, yeah, yeah. See, I have seen this stuff before. It's really interesting. The idea. It's quite genius, frankly. The idea is that you have a background that is kind of like a projector screen. And that, I guess that really is what it is, but more like a really high quality projector screen where it's embedded with these tiny little glass balls, basically. Uh, highly reflective, but directionally reflective. And you put that behind you, behind your subject. And then you have a ring light around the camera. So that's what that would be what this part is here. Let me pull this thing up. Was that going to load? Um, I guess that doesn't load. 
let's try let's try this let's see if this loads just to show you yeah here we go just to show you what it looks like so you get that hello you get this ring around it it'd be great if it actually opened big there we go you get this ring ring light around your camera and it shines apparently it'll shine either blue or green and depending on what color you want to, uh, you know, key out. You know, if, you, if you've got someone wearing a green shirt, you can't have a green chroma key, right? So you, that's one of the reasons you can swap these colors out. Uh, so this light, ring light goes around it. The light is shining straight at the, at the background, right? Because it's through the camera. And the light hits that and reflects straight back. And it doesn't diffuse out. And so you get a perfect green without having to actually light the background. One of the challenges of lighting a, a, a background for Chroma King is that it has to be even, right? If I've got a shadow, let's say I made this background green and I've got brighter area here than here, that color value, that luminance value and color value is going to be different here than here. And so when I'm Chroma Keying it, I can't say just that green. I have to say that green to that green. And the wider that expanse gets, the more likely you are to get things in it that you don't want. Right, it's going to start, oh, that shirt that I'm wearing that's kind of yellowish. Well, it's yellow towards green, and maybe it starts to pick up some of that, and I get holes in the shirt. Things like that become a problem. So you need to have that background perfectly even. Well, that's what this thing does, is it makes it perfectly even no matter where you point the camera. It's really, really clever. Uh, I've seen it demoed at trade shows. Um, you know, looked through it, played around with it myself a little bit. It seemed solid. It wasn't cheap. I guess I think this this seems like it's cheaper than it used to be. I think these used to be well over a thousand dollars. What did this say? I think this said. Let me see if I can find this thing at BNH. Um, uh, let's go to BNH's website and see if I can find it there, because it's. Oh, I'd like to see what they really are actually costing for good ones. Chroma key, LED chroma key. Let's see if that finds anything. No. And no, that's definitely not it. So that LED chroma key must be a brand. What was the other one? You said chromat. Let's try chromat. Chromat. See if that does anything. Um, reflect. Oh, here we go. Whoa. Oh, that's including a camera. That's a whole kit. Um, it's like whole kits. I just want the lights. Is that the whole kit? Let's just take a look at this thing. This can't be right. Uh, it's the backdrop, dual light ring, green LEDs, controller. The camera's not included in that. And that's almost $8,000. Well, there's a really good reason why I don't own one. <laughs> wow. Okay, well, clearly there are cheaper ones because when we did, oh, it was here. Um, that was only 580 bucks. All right, well, I would imagine for a factor of 10 price difference, you're going to find some differences in quality. If you're interested in that, you're going to have to do your own research. I've never used one. Um, it's not something I'm about to get in here to test out. I'm not super keen on it, but but it's cool. I mean, if you need it, if you want green screening, it is a it is definitely a, a method, definitely a thing to use. Um, let's see here. Emacs says, is there really a difference between USA model on those Lumix lenses and the ones made overseas lenses beside the warranty? Ah, that's gray market. Don't do that. Um, the warranty is the problem. That is the primary problem. And the reason that they're done, it's a different model number, and this is all about taxing and, um, and the warranty. It's, physically, it's the same thing, but if anything's wrong with it, you're going to have to send it to Europe, assuming if you're in the U.S. and you buy it in Europe or vice versa, you're going to have to send it to the other side to get fixed. And some can remanufacture. I don't know if Panasonic's got a policy, and some of them will say, no, we're not fixing it. That's, you bought it in the wrong place. You're supposed to buy it in the country that it's designed for. So, yes, you can save money, but it's generally not a good idea. In New York, there used to be all these stores that that's all they sold as gray market stuff. You go, wow, I can buy this camera for like $300 cheaper. Um, it was all gray market. And I think those stores have all been shut down because it's, I don't know if it's illegal, but it's definitely not encouraged. And it might actually be illegal, but that I don't know. I'm not a lawyer, nor do I play one on TV. Uh, Big Jake Guptill says, we've talked about at church doing a grayscale vinyl banner with certain patterns the shooting, uh, then shooting colored light on the banner to add color with grayscale, it'll just reflect. So if you put a grayscale vinyl background and then shown colored patterns on it, yeah, they'd have to be really bright. But I mean, sure, it'd work, right? It's like a slide projector. It's no different than that. Why, I don't know why gray, you get a benefit of doing gray versus a white one. It seems like you would lose, you'd have to be even brighter. Um, explain why gray. I, I might be missing something there. But Sure, you could absolutely do that. Uh, there's, 
there's a lot of different things you can do to make background. You can project a background, especially if you shoot in lower light or you can separate the background from the foreground, light your subject with your strobe or preferably with constant light so it's not quite as bright, and then project, you got an old slide projector, project an image on the background or get a flashlight and a, you know, whatever, and shine it. And you can put an image in the background. You can do stuff like that. It's a really cool thing to do as well. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah, Big Jake, I want to know why, why gray? That's an interesting, interesting question. Uh, Marvin saying BPS chroma key green photo backdrop screen chroma key photo backdrop studio. <laughs> I don't know what you're talking about, man. Um, I have no idea what that means. There's, you can buy back, I'll show you the backdrop that I have, uh, which I, where did I get that? Uh, is it B&H? Ah, whatever, I'm not going to show it to you. But the, the backdrop that I used for that um, uh, WWDC thing, it's a pop-up one, and it's green on one side, blue on the other. Really handy. We'll put a link to it down below. Ryan, don't forget, we'll put a link to it down below. Um, Kevin, also, 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 I've had success using the Luma key before. White background, any spill just becomes your backlight. Yeah, you can definitely do that if you're, if you have no white in your scene. It's always, that's always the thing. White is very common, so you, it's risky if you're doing that. Um, harder for video. Uh, Big Jake says, grayscale pattern to give different intensity reflections. Okay, cool. Cool. Well, if you end up doing it, if it works, send some photos or post a video about it and, and let me know. We'll link to it. Um, it sounds cool. I, I, I think... Coming up with ways to do interesting and creative backgrounds is, is really awesome, right? There's so many things you can do, so many creative ways to make backgrounds, whether you're using lights or shadows, props or textures or things like this, whatever it might be, there's just so many different ways to do creative backgrounds. Um, this background here, right, this is a, uh, obviously just a solid color, but this is a painted gray thing, but this is, this is wood, this is movable. I can take this down and I've got other ones. I've got white, I've got black, I've got wood. Um, when I first started doing this show, I had all wood theme. I decided that I like the monochrome better. But yeah, if I need something else for a client, want to change it up, and we've talked about that before. Um, that's cool. If you actually, if, you're, if you missed that whole thing, you want to know more about how the studio is built, we'll link to the playlist up here. I did a massive week long, everything about the studio. So if you're kind of curious about that, check that out. Um, we'll link to that up there. Okay, that's kind of it. That's kind of it. So tomorrow, um, like I said, I'm, I'm, I'm planning on doing the thing with lens, so we'll be out in the field. I just got to find somewhere good where I have a good solid cell signal and I can swap out the lenses. Um, so we'll do that. Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday of next week, I'm taking off. I've got uh, friends from out of town visiting, so I'm planning to take those three days off. However, I might do some impromptu photo moment stuff, mainly because I'm, I'm, I have a confession to make, mainly because I just bought something. And... I wasn't going to buy this, but then I did, and let me pull it up here, and I know that a lot of you guys are going to want to see this. <sighs> what can I say? I'm a sucker. I just kind of, I kind of felt like, I kind of felt like I had to. Hopefully I don't regret it. I don't think I'm going to regret it. I think it's going to be worth it, but I, 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 I just, I bought one. It'll be here Tuesday. Yeah. So, yeah, we're going to, we're going to. We're gonna have some fun. We'll do a we'll do an unboxing. And so I think it's arriving Tuesday. Um, so I'll do an unboxing. I'll do a first flight. Uh, you know, we'll have some fun. It'll be a great use for the Mevo because it's a nice big wide field of view and the thing's gonna go off into space and hopefully, hopefully it comes back. I've never flown a drone before. Never, ever. I've never flown anybody else's. I've never operated a drone. So this will be my first one. Wish me luck. I've seen those early DJI videos where people buy these like three hundred dollar, three thousand dollar Phantoms and then fly them into their garage door at hundred miles an hour. Oops! Now they have all kinds of really good safety stuff built in, so it's less of a concern. But that's what I'm going to do. Um, and yes, Joshua, this absolutely is your fault. I completely blame you. Uh, Sean Mark Nipper, happy Father's Day! Early Father's Day to you too. Uh, yeah, Father's Day present to myself. Well, it's a business expense, so I'm the father of the business. Does that count? <laughs> Most of the mother. But anyway, that's a whole other conversation. So that's it. Um, Kevin Rice says you have the Mavic. It's uh, oh, with the goggles on pre order. Cool. The Spark is easy to fly, easier than the Phantom. I know these things are. This one has like the force, right? You go, rise, Luke. It's. I can't wait. I wasn't going to get it because it's only 1080p. And I'm like, you know, if it's not 4K. Yeah. But it does look really cool. And then um, it's actually, I blame Casey. It's Casey Neistat's fault. He did a video. He was talking about how it's, it's just become his most used drone, even though it's only 1080p, because it's so small, it can go everywhere. Um, I, it's really cool. And I know the Mavic is super small. I, my plan was my plan was to buy a Mavic when the second generation came out. I waited. On, I didn't buy the first one right away. 
probably only because they were so backordered. I probably would have bought one if I could have bought, got it right away, um, which I think they learned their mistake because this is, you know, shipping now. It shipped this morning. I bought it last night. It shipped this morning. Um, the, uh, uh, the Mavic, it's obviously awesome. Like that, I really want that one. But I figured by the time kind of they were back in stock and like, eh, you know, I'm going to wait. I'll wait until Gen 2. And that one I will very likely get. Of course, we'll see how much I love this. If I decide that, you know, I'm just not that interested in a drone, then whatever. But um, something tells me I'm going to really enjoy it because they are fun. It's just a little bit low resolution. But it's a good start. It's a good start, right? Right. So that's what we're going to do. Uh, it'll arrive Tuesday. At least that's the plan. So expect Tuesday afternoon, unless we go out of town with our friends. But expect that Tuesday afternoon I'll do an unboxing, first flight, and stuff like that. Who knows? We'll see. Okay, guys. Uh, that's it. Yeah, we're out of here. Okay, guys, thank you very much for hanging around today. It's lovely to see you all, as always, and uh, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Bye-bye.